Okay, we're ready to go. Start with the salutation to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutasa Today is June 1st, 2013. Okay, good morning everybody. Well, we're in June already. <laughs> seems like <laughs> three weeks ago we were ending up the December section and now already it's June. <laughs> okay, so today we'll be taking Sutta number 97 in the Majjhimani Kaya. And then this is going to be, I'm going to use this sutta as a kind of takeoff point for looking at a number of other suttas in the Majjhima which deal with the set of qualities that are grouped together, sometimes called the four immeasurables, se uliang shin, and also sometimes called the four brahmaviharas, se fanju, is that expression used in Chinese? Is that the expression that's used in Chinese? The fan ju. Okay. Okay, so this sutta, sutta begins, well, it primarily concerns Sariputta, the Venerable Sariputta. So it begins at a time when the Buddha was living at Rajgir in the bamboo grove. And so on this occasion, the Venerable Sariputta was traveling in the southern hills. This is a group of hills to the south of Rajagaha, together with a large community of monks. Okay, then a certain monk who had spent the rainy season at Rajagaha came to the Sari, to Venerable Sariputta, exchanged greetings with him. And then the Venerable Sariputta asked him, is the Venerable, is the Blessed One, the Buddha, well and strong? So he says, the Buddha is well and strong. Is the Sangha of monks well and strong? This monk says, the Sangha of monks is also well and strong. Then Sariputta says, there is a Brahmin named Dananjani living at the Tandupala gate. Is that Brahmin Dananjali well and strong? And this monk then says, the Brahmin Dananjali too is well and strong. Now, it's said that before Sariputta was ordained as a Buddhist monk, he had been a friend of this Brahmin named Dananjani. So that's why he's concerned about his well-being. Okay, so then Sariputta asks, <laughs> is he diligent or heedful, friend? Which means, is he leading an upright life, you know, a virtuous life? So then this monk says, how could he be diligent? Or in other words, he's saying, he's certainly not a diligent friend. He plundered. <laughs> this sounds just like it came out of a news report, you know, last week or so. <laughs> he, pl 
he plunders Brahmin householders in the name of the king, <laughs> and he plunders the king in the name of the Brahmin householders. <laughs> <laughs> this mayor is robbing the treasury in the name of the federal government <laughs> or he, he's robbing the local treasury in the name of the federal government and he's stealing from the federal government in the name of the local government <laughs> okay his wife who would who is faithful, that is, who had been a devout Buddhist and came from a clan with faith, has died and he has taken another wife, a woman without faith, who comes from a clan without faith. It seems to be implying that they have faith in the Buddha and the Buddha's teaching. Though perhaps more generally, it just means that his previous wife was devoted to Dharma in the quite broad general sense of the shared Indian Dharma belief in the value of generosity, observing sila or the moral precepts, having devotion to the renunciants and supporting renunciants. Okay, so this is the report about Sariputta's old friend. And so when Sariputta hears this, he's somewhat disturbed by this news. And he says that this is bad news that we hear about the Brahman Dhananjani. Perhaps sometime in the near future, I might have a chance to meet him and have a little discussion with him in order to give him some advice or an admonition in order to re-establish him in the virtuous practices. Okay, so then Sariputta spends some time in, in the southern hills and then gradually he goes on a tour in the direction of Rajagaha and so eventually he arrives at Rajagaha and then now coming over to paragraph 4 one day taking his bowl and his extra robe he goes into Rajagaha for alms and then he approaches the Brahmin Dhananjani who has been milking the cows and when Sariputta comes to him Dhananjani, the Brahmin, offers him some fresh milk, asking him to drink some of this fresh milk until it is time for the meal. But Sariputta refuses this and then says, I have finished my meal for today and I shall be dwelling at the root of a tree and you may come there. It's a little bit strange that Sariputta doesn't just initially, immediately begin a conversation with the Brahmin Bhantananjani. Could there be some reason why he doesn't begin immediately by admonishing the Brahmin, but tells him, I'll be staying at the foot of that tree. You can come there whenever you want. Richard, if there's a mobile microphone, please take that. And, and secondly, when he's saying, oh, you can come visit me, that's implying generally that, that, he's, that he is superior to Dhanajani because normally supplicants and constituents and so on 
go to do darshan at the houses of their superiors. It's customary, say, in India and in Nepal, for people to appear at the, mm. at the houses of important persons. Mm-hmm. Uh, to ask to ask for favors, to mm-hmm. ask if there's something they can do for them, and so on, or, or in the morning, and and the person who goes to the other person's house is normally of lower status than the person who receives the visit. Uh, what is your name? Pat? Michael. Oh, you're Michael. I'm, I'm sorry because I didn't have my distance class. Okay. Oh, now I'm Michael. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to suggest also the possibility that um, it gives uh, the Brahmin an opportunity to display the fact that he's going to be receptive to what Shariputra has to say, uh, whether or not that's true, but that's the way it struck me. Yeah, that's, the, that's actually the, the thought that I had in mind. From the sutta, the sutta itself doesn't say any, it doesn't give any reason for Shariputra sort of withdrawing to the foot of a tree. But I was thinking of that rather than the reasons that Richard, Richard offered. Um, I'm trying to think. If Sariputta was going... You see that there's a practice which is allowed by Buddhist monks that they can impose on a lay person if they feel that the lay person is not... is in some way doing things that are harmful to the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching, or to the Sangha, or behaving disrespectfully. They can do this practice, it's called turning the bowl upside down, which means that they don't actually physically turn the bowl upside down, but they refuse to accept alms from a lay person. They make, usually it's a Sangha decision, a group decision. In fact, in 2007, In Burma, the Burmese monks, the younger monks, they had made this decision not to to turn the bowl upside down with regard to the generals in the military junta. Well, yeah, it's a a general customary rule in the area, for instance, what made Gandhi's fasting so powerful that he was effectively turning the bowl upside down and refusing food. Saying the country isn't behaving, I can't eat it. Yeah. Yeah, but in this case, I don't think Sariputta is doing that, rejecting the Brahmin's offer of milk as a kind of moral boycott of him. I think it's just the fact is that he has already taken his food for the day and now he's satisfied with that. But I think the reason why he's withdrawing to the, to the foot of the tree rather than immediately admonishing the Brahmin is, I think first by showing up at the Brahmin's house, he's sort of suggesting, aha, I know what you've been up to. I know that you haven't been behaving properly. But rather than start admonishing him and sort of laying a heavy trip on him, you know, becoming moralistic, he's, by withdrawing, he's in a sense giving the Brahmin time to reflect back upon himself and to think, am I going to you know, be open and receptive to what Sariputta has to say, even though It'll involve some criticism of my behavior. That's the way I would understand it. Though there's no explanation given in the text itself. (laughs) When I was a kid, my sister had to start to wear glasses and we used to tease her. Four eyes, four eyes. <laughs> now, <laughs> you <laughs> you could all get together and start teasing. Pante is six eyes, six eyes. Okay, so the Brahmin, after he eats his breakfast, then he goes to the Venerable Sariputta and they exchange the t- typical courtesies. Then Sariputta asks him, you know, it's a kind of loaded question. He says, are you diligent, Dananjane? And then Sar- the Brahmin answers, 
you know, just like any <laughs> small town or even big time politician today, he says, how can we be diligent, Sariputta, when we have to support our parents, our wife and kids, and our slaves, servants and workers, when we have to do our duty towards our friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives, towards guests, departed ancestors, the deities, the king, and when this body, or I myself, must also be refreshed and nourished. Okay, then Sariputta is going to give the Brahman a quite stern, a quite also but a very simple and direct um, argument against his attempt to justify his misbehavior. So he says, suppose someone here were to behave contrary to the Dharma, to behave unrighteously for the sake of his parents. Okay, then because of such behavior, when he dies, then he gets reborn in hell, and then the wardens of hell drag him off to hell. Okay, and then he comes before, this is in the typical picture of what happens, sort of metaphorically, after one dies, one comes before Yama, the god Yama, who is considered the protective deity of hell. Or actually he's the more, he is the deity of the dead, who questions the judge of the dead, who doesn't pass judgment on the dead, but asks them about their own behavior. And then the way they answer, they have to answer truthfully, and it's their reports about their own behavior that will determine their own destiny after death. So in this case, we can imagine that this person is dragged off and comes before Yama. And so, when Yama asks him, why did you misbehave? Why did you violate the basic precepts? So he says, it was because of my parents, because I want to look after my parents, that I behaved contrary to the Dhamma, contrary to the basic moral law. And so then he says, please don't let the wardens of hell drag me off to hell. Or would his parents, if his parents were brought onto the scene as witnesses, suppose the parents were to say, please don't drag him off to hell because it's for our sake that he behaved immorally or unrighteously. So would this be possible? And then the Brahman says, no, Sariputta, even while he was crying out, <laughs> the wardens of hell would still fling him into hell. So in other words, how would we justify or sort of explain the point of this very briefly, very concisely, you know, putting it in a kind of generalization, making a generalization out of it. Okay, think about it. We'll just go through the next section. Okay, so now we have an expansion of the same argument. Okay, suppose someone here were to behave contrary to the Dhamma or the moral law, to behave unrighteously for the sake of his wife and children, for the sake of slaves, servants and workers, for the sake of friends and companions, for the sake of kinsmen and relatives, for the sake of guests, for the sake of the departed ancestors, for the sake of deities, making offerings to the deities, for the sake of the king, for the sake of refreshing and nourishing himself. Okay, and so then the wardens of hell were to drag him off 
to hell to bring him in front of King Yama. Okay, so would he be able to free himself by pleading thus? It was for the sake of, you know, supporting my own life, maintaining myself, that I behaved immorally and unrighteously. And then others were to come to his defense and saying it was for the sake, here they're using the same appeal, it was for the sake of refreshing and nourishing himself that he behaved immorally, unrighteously. So please don't carry him off to hell. Then the Brahmin answers, No, Sariputta, even while he was crying out, the wardens of hell would fling him into hell. Okay, so what kind of generalization can we draw from this? Claudia? Claudia, okay. Um, that good intentions don't outweigh bad action? Or okay, that, yeah, that's, that's that. exactly the point. Yeah, even though the intentions might seem to be good, but they're not a justification for breaking the basic principles or precepts of morality. Of course, sometimes there can be conflicts of moral obligations. You know, suppose it was a matter of, I think probably most of you or many of you have read Les Miserables, the novel by Victor Hugo or at least seen <laughs> the play or the, the movie <laughs> or you know the basic story Jean Valjean who is the hero of the novel this is a time when there's great poverty in France and his I think it was his sister and her children were really extremely hungry and so he broke the window, broke into a bakery and st stole a loaf, some loaves of bread in order to feed his sister and her children. And because of this, he was caught by the police and then condemned to hard labor in prison for something like seven years. Okay, in a situation where there is extreme, I say, desperation, could we say that stealing the loaf of bread would, I mean, of course it's breaking the precepts, but would it create an unwholesome karma, the weight that could even justify being in prison for seven years, not to speak of going to hell? Yeah, okay, what, about, what about allowing your family to starve to death rather than taking a loaf of bread? Would that get you to hell? I would say, in this case, allowing the family to starve to, to, to death rather than making that decision to break a precept would be, in my opinion, we won't speak about rebirth and hell, but it would be a heavier moral transgression than breaking the precept in order to Right. Well, isn't that, I mean, without the metaphor of hell, isn't that the relevant answer? The question is whether breaking the rule one way is going to result in more, dem in, in more demerit than breaking and yeah. doing the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And if, uh, if you can answer no, yeah. then obviously you don't really believe that the rule is absolute in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I have questions about the absolute... The idea of absolutely obligatory, absolutely binding moral principles. I think moral principles have to be considered in the light of context and situations. Yeah, there's actually, there was, I don't remember the name of the book, but um, a researcher who studies moral psychology did a whole 
study on, I think one of the first examples he used was with uh, somebody whose wife needed medication and didn't have access to the medication and he maybe broke into a pharmacy. And then what he did was he studied all of the rationales and the explanations. So the moral reasoning was sort of where the judgment might be rather than the intention and the action itself, the reasoning behind it. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one oh, more so comment. It, then. A, oh. Okay, no, no, we'll take your comments. Take your comment. Richard, oh, go ahead. Well, it, it's a question of the level of abstraction in which the rule is stated. If you say that, the, you know, that what's good is, is to preserve or promote life, yeah. and that, yeah. you know, that uh, the preservation of property rights uh, has some role in that, but yeah. it's not yeah. absolute. That's yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And then just, you know, to take the... Another like extreme counterexample against the idea of absolutely binding moral principles is the classical example in Nazi Germany where the SS is out to capture the Jews and so there will be some Germans families that hide Jews in their basement or in the attic. So when the SS come around asking are there any Jews here? So the family who's protecting them will say, no, I haven't seen any. So telling, uh, speaking falsehood in order to save the lives of these innocent people. But anyway, I, my assumption would be that the situation which is being described <laughs> in this passage is not where Dhananjani's parents are in desperate, a desperate plight, where their lives hinge upon where their lives are dependent upon him breaking the precept in order to get some wealth to give to them but rather we could imagine that he is maybe building a nice comfortable mansion for them or buying them a new uh, 30 inch television set or you know give it buying a new set of furniture Swedish, white oak furniture, whatever. Okay, and then also I think maybe also the descriptive terms here, contrary to the Dhamma behaving at Unrighteously, it's not saying anything actually about observing specific precepts, but what is the conduct that accords with Dhamma or with righteousness? Okay, so the Buddha continues his questions. He says, I'm sorry, Sariputta continues the questions. He says, Who is better, one who for the sake of his parents behaves contrary to the Dhamma, behaves unrighteously, or one who for the sake of his parents behaves according to the Dhamma? behaves righteously. Okay, so Dhananjani replies, one who for the sake of his parents behaves contrary to the Dhamma and so on is worse. The one who for the sake of his parents behaves in accordance with the Dhamma is better. Okay, so then Sariputta tells him that there are other kinds of work profitable and in accordance with the Dhamma, by means of which one can support one's parents and at the same time both avoid doing evil and practice merit. So I think this is the key passage which resolves that apparent moral dilemma. So what Dhananjani has probably been doing is maybe siphoning off wealth to which over which he has stewardship in order to give it to his parents or exploiting others, maybe not paying his workers in order to take the wealth and give it to his parents. And so he's violating basic moral precepts um, in order to support his parents. But at the same time, as Sariputta points out, that there are other kinds of work that he could do. So it's not, he's not in a situation where 
either he behaves dishonestly or his parents have to suffer in misery. But he can do some other kind of work which is honest, upright, virtuous, earn enough to support his parents. And by doing this kind of righteous work, he'll be avoiding evil and practicing merit. Practicing merit both by observing right livelihood and then acquiring righteous wealth in order to do other deeds of merit. Okay, so then Sariputta follows through the same questionnaire with regard to the other people who are in some way dependent upon Dhananjani, his wife and children and so forth, right on, right down to supporting himself, his own body. And so, at the end of paragraph 25, Sariputta sums it up and says there are other kinds of work profitable in accordance with the Dharma by means of which one can support yourself, refresh and nourish your own body, and at the same time both avoid doing evil and practicing merit. Okay, so then when Sariputta had given this advice, this admonition to the Brahmin, then Anjani, the Brahmin left him, and then left after some time Sariputta must have gotten up and returned to the monastery in Rajagaha, the Bamboo Grove Monastery. Apparently, my assumption is that the Brahmin Dhananjani accepted Sariputta's advice and changed his way of life. Okay, sometime later, we don't know how, how much later, the Brahmin Dhananjani became seriously ill, and so he sent a messenger to the monastery, to the Blessed One, paying his respects to the Blessed One, and then asking the Buddha to send Sariputta to see him out of compassion. Okay, so the, mess the messenger fulfills his duty and then Sariputta comes to visit the Brahmin. Apparently the Brahmin is probably lying on a bed which it turns out is going to be his deathbed. Okay, so Sariputta comes to the Brahmin, exchanges pleasantries with him, then asks the Brahmin whether he's getting better. And the Brahmin in section 29 says, I'm not getting better, I am not comfortable, my painful feelings are increasing. And then he uses a number of stock similes that we find elsewhere in the suttas to describe his pain. It says his, his as if a strong man was splitting open his head with a sharp sword, as if a strong man had tied a headband around his head and pulled with tough leather strap and pulling on that strap, or as if a skilled butcher had carved up the belly of an ox with a sharp knife. Okay, so this is like the pain that the Brahmin is experiencing. And so Sariputta must realize at this point that the Brahman is soon going to pass away. And so now he wants to direct the Brahman's mind to a suitable realm of rebirth. And so he uses a kind of questionnaire. I'm in paragraph 30 now. He asks the, the Brahman, what is better, hell or the animal realm? The Brahman says the animal realm. Which is better, the animal realm or the realm of the pratas, the spirits? So the realm of the pratas is better. Which is better, the realm of the pratas or the human realm? The Brahman says the human realm. So which is better, human beings or the gods of the four great kings? 
the gods belonging to the heaven of the four great kings. We go in sequence here. I don't read each exchange. So the heaven of the four great kings. Then we come to the Tava Tingza, the heaven of the 33. Then the Yama Devas. Then the Tusita Devas, the gods of the Tusita heaven. Then the gods who delight in creating and then the gods who wield power over the creations of others. So what has been going on here is a kind of survey of the different realms of existence according to the Buddhist cosmology. And from the dialogue, it seems that this picture of the universe is shared by both Sariputta as a Buddhist and the Brahmin. So we could suppose perhaps the Brahmins don't have exactly the same cosmology, but there would have been some similarities. So we don't know, you know, the exact words of the dialogue. Maybe Sariputta would have been using the words that would have been familiar to the Brahmin from the typical Brahmin cosmology. But because this is coming down as a Buddhist text, it, was been, it would have been transposed into the words or the concepts of the Buddha's cosmology. But if we take a look, a kind of overview of this Buddha's cosmology, we see that there are three realms which constitute what are called in the Buddhist scheme the dugatti the, or the apaya. These are the three bad realms. Apaya, I usually translate as the plane, the plane of misery, and dukkati as the bad des destinations. And so the three bad destinations, which are the results of heavy, unwholesome karma, are the hells, the animal realm, and the world of the pratas sometimes translated hungry ghosts, or uh, I prefer afflicted spirits. These are beings who are they're somewhat in proximity to the human world, though invisible to us, and they suffer various kinds of affliction, not as severe, nowhere nearly as severe as in the hells, but they often depicted as undergoing strong hunger and thirst, which they can't satisfy. So those are the three bad destinations. Then we come to the sukati, which are the good destinations. Those are the good destinations or the happy destinations in the sensual sphere of existence. And we have seven of these realms. The one that we're most familiar with is the human realm. Most familiar with <laughs> the one that, we're, that we live in ourselves is the human realm. But then in Buddhist cosmology, there are six heavenly realms depicted as existing above the human realm, superior to the human existence in some respects. We don't have to go into the details of them. One is called the heaven of the four great kings. There are four divine kings who rule over this heaven and each has his own compartment his own division within this heaven. Then comes the Tava Tingza, the heaven of the 33, which is presided over by Sakra, 
or Indra, the lord of the gods. Then come the Yama gods, of which very little is said in the Buddha's texts. Then comes the Tusita heaven, the heaven of delight. This is where the Bodhisattva lives before he takes rebirth in the human realm. It's where the next Buddha, Maitreya or Maitreya, is supposed to be living now. And many of the Buddha's own lay disciples, or as some of them, are depicted as taking rebirth in Tusita, like Anattapindika, Visaka. The Buddha's own mother, when she passed away, she was reborn in Tusita. Then come the gods who delight in creation, creating. Again, not much is said about them. In my picture that this is the heavenly realm where we get Mozart and Bach and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, the great artists and musicians are reborn there. Then above that is the gods who wield power over others' creations. <laughs> that is the god, the heavens for the editors and the film producers, <laughs> the people who uh, you know, create the companies like the music record, do we have records anymore? The music labels or who construct the museums that purchase the works of art. <laughs> but that's my own conception. <laughs> okay, so these are the six heavens of the sensual sphere. And so Sariputta, we could say, has been guiding the Brahman Dhananjani to directing his mind to each of these heavens. Okay, so now Sariputta takes another step. In paragraph 31, he says, what do you think is better? What is better? The gods who wield power over other crea others' creations or the Brahma world. Okay, so this is a Brahma Loka. And now above the sense sphere heavens, there is an entirely different realm of existence which is sometimes summed up just under the label, the Brahma world. Now, the, six, the seven good destinations of the sense sphere, those are the fruits or results of good, wholesome karma of an ordinary kind. If, well, some of it is extraordinary, but the kind of karma which is created by generosity, observing precepts, maybe the lower stages of meditation. But when one develops the meditation to higher or superior levels of deep samadhi, that creates a kind of affinity of the mind with the realm of existence beyond the sensuous sphere. It creates the karmic formation that leads to rebirth into the Brahma world. And so now Sariputta has directed the mind of Dananjani to the Brahma world. Okay, and so when Sariputta mentions the Brahma world, then the Brahman becomes delighted because this was the aspiration of the Brahmins, the way they're depicted in the Buddhist text. Their ideal, their aim is to be reborn in the Brahma world and to come into the company to live in communion with the Lord of the Brahma world who is called Mahabrahma, the great deity almost like the god of Christianity. So when Sariputta mentions the Brahma world, then Dhananjani is delighted, because that was probably his great wish or aspiration. 
So then Sariputta thinks, these Brahmins are devoted to the Brahma world. Suppose I teach the Brahmin Dhananjani the path to the Brahma, the Brahma world, or it's called the path to the company of Brahma, the way to come into the company of Brahma the Great. Okay, so now Sariputta starts to teach the path to the company of Brahma. So he teaches, I'm in paragraph 32, here a monk, or it could be anyone, dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, so the second quarter, the third, the fourth, above, below, around, and everywhere, to everyone as to himself, he abides pervading the entire world with a mind of loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. This is the path to the company of Brahma. And then he repeats the same thing with the other three qualities that constitute the path to the Brahma world. That is, the mind of boundless compassion, the mind of altruistic joy, the mind of equanimity. So these are the four states Most often they're grouped together and they're called sometimes the four immeasurables, the four upamanya. Also called the four Brahma Vihara, the dwellings, the dwelling places of Brahma. And so these four qualities, they seem to be somewhat similar, but usually we make a distinct, or at least some of them seem to be similar, but we make a subtle distinction, or there, there are subtle differences between them. And so we distinguish them by saying that loving kindness will write these four qualities down. Most of you probably know them. Metta or loving kindness, its distinguishing feature is the wish for the welfare and happiness of all beings, oneself and others. So that is its characteristic. And so metta is you, of the four, metta is usually developed first because this loving kindness is the basis for all for the others. It's through developing this loving kindness, this feeling of empathy with others, sharing with others their wish for their own well-being and happiness, that one can develop the other Brahma Viharas. And so then karuna, or compassion, has the quality of feeling the suffering of others as one's own and wishing to eliminate or alleviate the suffering of others. So when one has true love and a feeling of kindness for others, then when one sees others undergoing suffering, then one wants them to be free from suffering and one generates the wish for them to be free from suffering. 
Then mutita, altruistic joy. The word mutita originally simply meant joy, but it takes on a more specialized meaning in this context. The meaning of, I translated altruistic joy. This means rejoicing in the success the good fortune of others or rejoicing in the virtues and good qualities of others. And then the fourth Brahmavihara, the fourth divine quality is Upeka which we trans- is usually translated equanimity, or it might also be translated, perhaps in this context, impartiality. So we could understand this as not having partial feelings towards others of preference for this one or aversion to that one, but looking upon all beings equally. And also it's the ability to remain equanimous in face of the suffering and success of others so that one is not emotionally torn when others undergo suffering one experiences compassion for them but one is not sort of torn up inside by their suffering and when others that one likes experience success a good fortune one doesn't become overexcited and ebullient, but one maintains a certain tranquility or balance of mind. Okay, now these are you know, four excellent, exalted qualities, but in the Buddha's teaching, on their own, we can see they are not sufficient for liberation, for enlightenment but on their own, sort of their own dynamic, leads to rebirth in the Brahma world, beyond the sensphere heavens, into the realm of the sublime deities, the Brahma deities. And so since the, in the sutta, the Brahman Dhananjani was delighted when he heard the the word, the Brahma world, So Sariputta, recognizing this, taught him the path to rebirth in the Brahma world. And so Sariputta leads him, you know, through the four Brahma Viharas. We could imagine that while Dhananjani is lying there on his bed, and as Sariputta is explaining the method, probably he's teaching him in greater detail, then has come down in the sutta, that the Brahman is following along and directing his mind accordingly. So as the Brahman is listening, he's also practicing the four Brahmaviharas. And probably because of his past merits, he succeeds in obtaining them. He actually enters into those meditative absorptions. Okay, when Sariputta finishes this discourse on the four Brahma Viharas, then he says, what, then the Brahman Dhananjani says to Sariputta, he says, please, Master Sariputta, when you go back to the monastery, pay homage in my name with your head at the Buddha's feet and tell him that the Brahman Dhananjani is afflicted suffering and gravely ill. Okay, so then it said that the Venerable Sariputta, having established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, this is very important, rose from his seat and departed while there was still more to be done. Okay, when the text says that Sariputta established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, the first implication of this is that 
through his instructions, Sariputta was able to guide the Brahmin into the four meditative states of the Brahma Viharas, so that the Brahmin, while lying there, was actually able to enter into the four meditative absorptions of the Brahma Viharas, which, as, as I said, those are the karmic causes or the karmic forces that lead to rebirth in the Brahma world. But there's something else in this paragraph, which is or this sentence, which is significant. What is it that sort of jumps out from the page? Some, excuse me. That's the next phrase. But from this phrase itself, let's say from the first part of the sentence. Okay, I heard it. Right, that the Brahma world is called inferior. I think the Pali word here is actually hina. <laughs> the same word is used in hina. <laughs> so, you know, from the standpoint of the Buddha's teaching, rebirth in the Brahma world on its own is inferior to something that lies beyond. And then the next important aspect of the sentence is indicated by the second phrase, the second clause, that Sariputta departed when there was still more to be done. And what more is to be done, that will be indicated by the rest of the sutta. Okay, so soon after the Venerable, the text tells us, soon after the Venerable Sariputta had left, the Brahmin Dhananjani died and he reappeared in the Brahma world. So apparently he had changed his way of life so that he was engaging in meritorious action. And then through Sariputta's guidance, he developed the four immeasurables, the four Brahma Viharas. And that was sufficient to bring him to rebirth in the Brahma world. Okay, now the Buddha, when this happens, the Buddha addresses the monks and says that Sariputta, having established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, rose from his seat and departed while there was still more to be done. So this is happening, apparently this is happening before Sariputta arrives back at the monastery. So the Buddha knows with his you know, supervision, with his superior vision, not supervision <laughs> in the sense of supervising things, with his superior vision or knowledge, he knows what has taken place. And so he informed, well, this is quite radic almost a radical step by the Buddha. It's like he's criticizing Sariputta in front of the whole Sangha as having made a mistake. You know, usually when the Buddha speaks about Sariputta, He's always praising him and says that, Sariputta, there's nothing for which I blame you, nothing for which I criticize you. But here he's criticizing Sariputta in front of the whole Sangha. Okay, so now Sariputta arrives back in the presence of the Buddha. And after paying homage to him, he sits, uh, unusual, he sits down to one side and then he reports to the Buddha that Venerable Sir, he says, the Brahmin Dhananjani is afflicted, suffering and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Blessed One's feet. So Sariputta at this time, at this point, you could see from the fact that he's delivering the message in this way, he doesn't know that 
the Brahmin has passed away. Okay, but now the Buddha is sort of indirectly delivering a reproach to Sariputta. He says, Sariputta, having established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, why did you rise from your seat and depart while there was still more to be done? You see, now the Buddha recognizes that there was still more to be done. So what is the explanation for this? Maybe anybody can give some answer why the Buddha is pointing this out, why he's using this kind of language. Okay, Michael? Yeah, uh, please use that uh, mobile mic. There's always something more to be done. So the idea that there's something more to be done yeah. is almost, in a sense, academic. There's always something more to be done. There's always a higher yeah. place. So from that point of view, it's not troubling. But what is troubling to me is the superficial idea, or maybe the very real idea, that the Buddha is actually chiding or reproaching Shariputra. I'm reminded of the um, of medicine Buddha in the Mahayana tradition, where we have for each person what they're capable of. The hearing and the Dharma is brought to each individual. Wait, I didn't catch the last sentence that you said. I'm sorry. I didn't catch the last sentence you just um, said. That the idea that each each person receives the Dharma yeah. according to his own ability to receive the Dharma. Yeah, yeah. And another, it seems to me, although it may be very wrong, the feeling I got was that Shariputra, and I clearly want to cut him some slack here, was giving to the Brahman what the Brahman was capable of receiving to yeah. the level the, Brahma, the Brahman was capable of receiving it. Yeah. However, the Buddha doesn't seem to be in agreement with that unless we do some tricks with the language. So I don't know yeah. what to say. Okay, maybe somebody that. else have some idea about this. Okay. Well, oh, okay, let's take Barbara. Barbara here. And then, what is your name? John. 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 Young, okay. Barbara, you go. Um, I'm reminded of a story of a famous uh, Zen teacher living American, well, not no longer living, but who described the famous being Zen with teacher, his... What did you say then? Pardon? Then you said no longer living. You said something before that? Well, I meant the famous Zen modern, teacher? but he's no longer alive. Oh, I see, I but, see. I mean, it's not from yeah. hundreds of years ago. Yeah. But I remember him describing being with his mother on her deathbed. Yeah. And she was a good old... Italian Catholic woman, yeah. and so what he did was to say the rosary with her. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm kind of on Shariputra's side here, and I'm not sure that mm. the Buddha is necessarily reproaching him. He's more mm. stating the facts. Okay, he is stating the facts. In fact, the, yeah, there isn't a direct reproach. It's not a direct reproach to, Kel, to Shariputra. But he's indicating that Sariputta, you know, he's, in a sense, I'd say he's criticizing. Okay. Or indicating that Sariputta didn't do everything that he should have done. But it also reminds me of, in the, mod in the news this last couple of weeks, of what's going on in Rome. That the P Pope Francis has made the statement that atheists... Uh, yeah. If they live good lives, it yeah. can be redeemed. Yeah. And the Vatican, I've never heard of this happening, came out and explained that wasn't the way it was. <laughs> the Vatican is differing from Pope I see France. the Vatican tried to reinterpret the Pope's words so that <laughs> they didn't mean what they apparently yeah. meant. Anybody else have some idea? That's young, we didn't take. I want to add to what Michael was saying that I think maybe Sariputta needed to work more. Maybe he wasn't fully awakened yet. Okay. Uh, maybe, I don't know, that's another thing. And also, 
I'm getting also this whole idea, looking at from hindsight, the history of Buddhism in India, how Buddhism died out because, I guess for many reasons, but the, the very close relationship between the monastics and the lay people and how they kind of, they're so interdependent. If this is a wholesome community, then you might have maybe more wholesome lay people. Yeah. And the Nanjani seems like maybe he cap- was capable of more. And okay, okay. Actually, and so... Yeah. I don't know. I mean, these are all sort of reading the suttas and kind of inferring this yeah. or implying that maybe Sariputta needs to develop more, but also needs to maybe yeah. understand his, yeah. the people he's teaching, their capacity. Maybe there was more to be done. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll take one more and then Look, I'll well, give my opinion. Just to add on with, with, with uh, you, Yang was saying is, uh, yeah, like you were saying earlier, um, the Buddha had superior vision. Yeah. So maybe he, with his superior vision, he he saw that this Brahmin had more abilities than than um, than than you know he could have gone higher. Yeah. Okay. You know? Yeah. So he was probably sad that or disappointed that he didn't go as higher. Yeah. 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 Some of some of the statements are on the right track. Yeah. Now you see Sariputta, there are certain like, for Sariputta at this point we could say was an arahant. So in terms of his own spiritual development, there was nothing more to be done. He didn't have to develop you know, any further in order to gain liberation. But there are certain knowledges which are considered to be, some of them special to a Buddha, which are not shared by other arahants. And or else some ar- arhats will also have them. But apparently Sariputta didn't have the special knowledges to the extent of some of the other arhats, or by no means at the level of the Buddha. And that is the ability to know the tendencies and dispositions of the people being instructed. So when the Buddha says that there was something further to be done, something more to be done, this means that the Buddha would have seen and known, you know, through his supervision, superior vision, that the Brahman Dhananjani probably had the potential to become at least a stream enterer, to get on to the path to liberation. Or if he had the Brahma Viharas, perhaps even to get on to the path to this third stage of enlightenment third of the four stages, the stage of non-returner. And Sariputta probably, I mean, did, didn't have that knowledge. And so he wasn't able to read the mental proclivities, the seed tendencies in Dhananjani's mind, the deep tendencies. And so when he guided him to the Brahma world, he thought, This is sufficient. I mean, maybe five years ago, ten years ago, the guy was heading for hell. (laughs) And now he's gotten him not only, you know, out of a destination towards hell, but he's directed him to the Brahma world. So Sariputta could have been quite satisfied with that. But the Buddha would have seen that Dhananjani would have had enough panya or wisdom to have achieved at least the first stage of enlightenment. And now what happens when one is reborn in the Brahma world without having that wisdom developed, you know, that insight into the Dharma, then one can remain in the Brahma world for, can be several aeons, even hundreds of aeons, But that wholesome karma will eventually wear out, become exhausted, depleted, and then one passes away and comes back into the human world. The way I think of it, you know, you're enjoying this bliss and peace of the Brahma world, and one passes away and comes out from the mother's womb with a wah, 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 and then is back kindergarten, first elementary school, high school, all the pain of adolescence, first love, 
applying for college, student loans, searching for a job, unemployment, getting insurance, all over again. <laughs> Whereas, if one has gained, like even the first stage of enlightenment, then one can be, re be reborn in the Brahma world, but one will go on developing one's wisdom in the Brahma world, and then pass into final liberation. But what's interesting, I was actually had two suttas to take today, but <laughs> we didn't get to the second one, but I'll take it next time. But I'll just sort of give you a coming attraction or foreshadow what's to come. This is a sutta, it's number 99 in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha is teaching a young Brahmin by the name of Subha, who asks about he asked the Buddha, do you know the way to the Brahma world? And the Buddha says, I know the way to the Brahma world. I could tell it to you. Just like somebody giving directions to get from Cold Spring to Duangyan Monastery. And then the Buddha gives him, you know, the formula for the four Brahma Viharas. And then the Buddha, uh, the young Brahman Subha says to the Buddha after getting this instruction on the Brahma Viharas, he says, wonderful, excellent, venerable Gotama, I go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Please be my refuge as long as I live. And now I'm very busy. I have some other things to do. And he gets up and leaves. And so the Brahma just, uh, the Buddha just leaves off there with instruction on the, Brahma, on the Brahma Viharas. The Buddha doesn't give him any teaching on impermanence, suffering, non-self, dependent origination, the Four Noble Truths. And so Subha, this young Brahman Subha, doesn't get the teaching that leads to liberation. But he gets just, he asked about the teaching for going to the Brahma world. And he receives that teaching. And then he, he goes for refuge, but then he departs. I don't recall any other sutta in which the Buddha meets with this young Brahmin Subha and then gives him you know, some deeper instructions that will lead him onto the path of enlightenment. It could be that the young Brahmin Subha, his mind just didn't have the, the tendency, those, inc that, those propensities. So the Buddha, in this case, he was like the Italian Zen master who taught his Italian mother, you know, gave her an, to, pray to, you know, to pray to God in order to go to heaven. Okay, any questions or comments? Please, again, your, your name again. Uh, Victor. Victor? Victor, yeah, Victor. Yeah, yes. okay. Uh, one question is, uh, for us as, as uh, practitioners, uh, what is the importance of practicing uh, Brahma Vihara uh, meditation and is it something that... Yeah, my own opinion is that the Brahma Viharas are very, very important. Um, because I see them as functioning at every stage in the Buddhist path and also as fundamental values and quite apart from the Buddhist path but in human relationships and in you know, communal, communal life. I was, I'm going to take a selection of texts on the Brahma Viharas and put them together and then we'll send them out to everybody who's registered for the course. So for the next class, that's what we'll do. It will be taking that portion of the Subha Sutta, not the whole Sutta, because the earlier parts of the Subha Sutta are dealing with a lot of matters of concern to the Brahmins. But it'll do an overview of some suttas from, mostly from the Majjhima Nikaya, but from other Nikayas dealing with the Brahma Viharas. Then I'll bring up the point, the point that you just addressed 
in the next class. Suki, take, uh, let the microphone come back. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's on. I think it's on. Oh, it wasn't on. Okay. When a person is a stream enter and goes to Brahma Loka, yeah. um, can he practice further at that Brahma Loka? Okay. The question is when a person is a stream enter and then takes rebirth in the Brahma Loka. Can he practice further in the Brahma Loka? Yeah. Definitely yes. And in the selection of text that I'm going to send out, we'll see that this is the case. From some of the texts, the short, some short, short suttas in the Ankutara Nikaya affirm that this is what can happen. How far, I mean, um, so that means... Um, at the Brahma Loka, he can attain enlightenment. Yeah, in the Brahma Loka, he can achieve arhatship and then pass directly into Nirvana from the Brahma Loka without coming back into the human wor- into the human world. Thank you. If you want to look up in advance, it's Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Four. <laughs> <laughs> number one sutta is number 123 then the other sutta I think is number 125 one is concerned with the four jhanas the other with the four Brahma Viharas any, any further questions or comments ok then we'll break take a break for the lunch And then we'll have a discussion period, say 12 o'clock, 12.10, maybe 12.10, we'll start 12.10. Okay, so we will end with the sharing of the merits. And if there's anybody who is not registered, if you write your email contact down then you can give it Johnny will you take it and give it to Kaiti then she'll put it on the into the computer okay Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakanto Sasanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakanto Desanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang etavata cham hehi sampadang pun sampadang sabe deva anumodantu sabha sampati siddhya Etavatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe bhutanumodantu sabha sampati siddhya Etavatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe satanumodantu sabha sampati siddhya Bhavagupadaya avici heta to, etantare satakayupapana, 
rupi a rupi cha sanya sanino tu ka pamu cham tu pu san tu ni bu ting Okay, so then we end with three bows to the Buddha. Right.